Welcome to Professor Sutton, uh, from Imperial College London and to Professor Boon Lim, clinical lead for the uh, Imperial Syncope Unit at Hammersmith Hospital, both members of STARS Medical Advisory Committee. Thank you for joining and for being available for patients. Good morning, Trudy. Thank you for having us. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So, uh, Professor Sutton, what treatment options are there once you have a diagnosis? We've heard about counter maneuvers, which can help, could be classed as a treatment. Uh, what, are, what other treatments are there? Well, we, we, we skipped so far the business of making a diagnosis, except by history. Uh, but the treatment options are, first of all, to explain the problem to the patient and they they need to understand what is happening and that although it's dramatic very unpleasant they're not going to die of it um, many have had several by the time they reach the doctor who can do this and that doctor will understand that they're really quite frightened and so the family, because the family's seen them having syncope, and frankly, the patient looks dead for a short time. So they not unreasonably think that death could follow one of these. So that's the first objective in treating the patient is explanation and reassurance that it may recur, but it would not result in death. After that, then uh, we have general measures. And the only one which has any scientific proof is physical countermeasures, where trials have been done showing that syncope is around half as common in the patients who can apply it than if they don't apply it. And, but this, of course, depends on sufficient warning for the patient to know what to do and when to do it and being taught how to do it. So the other supportive measures, one has been mentioned already, support stockings. Unfortunately, there's no scientific proof that this works, although it logically it should help. Um, there's drinking more water, because most people drink too little water. And uh, so, uh, I mean, I personally feel that uh, one and a half liters is quite a lot for me, but it isn't enough. And so we should go over two liters, and in some cases, nearly to three in people who are active and perspire a lot. Then there's salt. Uh, salt in the diet uh, is something which the media have been very successful in telling us to reduce because it does have a role in high blood pressure. That role is still controversial, but somehow we've taken up uh, the reduction of salt in many cases very well, too well. Salt retains water in the body, so whatever you drink is more likely to be retained if you have sufficient salt. How could you measure this? Well, uh, I say six to 10 grams a day of salt. So uh, you could take a teaspoon or a weighing machine, put uh, five grams or 10 grams on the uh, weighing machine and pour the salt onto the uh, scales and stop when you reach 10 and you see how much salt that is. Always bear in mind that if you eat prepared foods, they're heavily salted. And they don't even tell you on the package how heavily. Uh, so th this is uh, a another measure which is important. I have in the past recommended reduction in, in caffeine consumption. Uh, there's absolutely no proof of this. But it, it does seem to me logical because caffeine is a diuretic, which means it puts out more water. So it, the opposite is water. 
I mean, if they had many patients presenting with syncope who were drinking 15 cups of coffee a day, and I say, oh, do you really need that much? You know, maybe five would be good. So uh, uh, avoidance is another thing because patients may tell you in the history that they typically faint in this circumstance or that circumstance. And then they can be encouraged to avoid that circumstance. Uh, so th these are general measures. Then we get to, to medical treatment, which unfortunately is not very good. Uh, tablets. There are several which uh, may help. Probably the best of these is one called Midodrin, M-I-D-O-D-R-I-N-E. What this does is to constrict the blood vessels a little. So when they tend to be opening up, say with standing up, uh, there's some resistance to that. It's probably more effective on the veins than the arteries. And it is a drug which has side effects and uh, doesn't last very long in the body. So three or four times a day are necessary. This is not very comfortable for the patient. It should not be taken by females who could become pregnant because we don't know what it does to a growing baby. It's never been studied. The second drug uh, is fludrocortisone, which sounds like uh, cortisone, but uh, it is not actually cortisone, but it, it retains water. It comes from the same gland as cortisone. And as we discussed with salt, it may have that effect of retaining water and increasing the central blood volume. As Boone explained, this could be beneficial. Neither drug is re really very effective, but in a patient who's very symptomatic may have to be tried. And if it works in reducing your tanks, then my thinking would be uh, six months, try to phase it out. If it doesn't work, uh, a tax return, then another six months, but always with a view to stopping it in the longer term. Lastly, to be mentioned, but very rarely necessary, is a pacemaker. We return to the vagal part of vasovagal syncope, where the last straw is the heart slowing down. And the pacemaker is very good at stopping that. The problem is that it happens at the end of the attack, when it is at its worst, and the pacemaker can only reverse the slow heart, cannot undo all the other things that have happened before. So it may not be effective and should be selected very carefully. Thank you. So I now have a few questions. Can I just add to that briefly, Trudy? Uh, I, I uh, so I'm sorry to interrupt, but uh, I, I just want to qualify Richard's uh, statement on, on salt, just, just for clarity, that there are a number of patients who see me and who really cannot believe that we're recommending so much salt. And uh, what, one of the things that uh, particularly we, we see uh, is a group of elderly patients, for example, who have frequent episodes of syncope, but whose resting blood pressure is high. Uh, in, in those patients, the, the high salt intake is not something that I might recommend. And actually, we, we should check with patients, or patients should check that the baseline blood pressure is reasonable or low normal uh, prior to embarking on that uh, salt intake recommended. So for, and that uh, I guess would apply to 85% of the patients we see with syncope. But just in case you have a high existing blood pressure, then it, it may be that, uh, that that salt bit is not something that you should take on board. Always consult your doctor or your specialist syncope doctor, particularly if you have both a high and a low blood pressure. That's a tricky combination. You mentioned the elderly there, and many elderly people faint after they've had a heavy meal. Any reason for this? 
Yeah, mm -hmm. so um, if, I, if I come back to my diagram and I show you to, I, and I focus on the reason why you get what we call pulse prandial presyncope or syncope, this is to do with the fact that after a meal, so I'm just gonna ask you to compare the gut here Look at the look at the circulation within the gut, which should be nice and, if you like, uh, uh, narrow in this gut vessels. After a large meal, necessarily, if we're going to a large meal, what we see is the great expansion of the gut vessels, and necessarily so, because imagine if you're eating a meal, digesting you have the contents within the stomach and the small intestine which are full of valuable nutrients which need now to be absorbed and taken straight to the liver and to the rest of the body to store. Now, these nutrients which are coming through three, four times a day need to provoke a response in the gut to expand the dilatation within the butt, the 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 gut and this is sometimes also known as the uh, vagal response in the gut so the vagus is also known as the rest and digest response it is the direct opposite the yin to the yang of the fright or flight sympathetic response and you can imagine why when having a meal you're very yin you're very dilated and if you couple that with alcohol in a warm environment, for example, you're also very dilated, for example, in your skin and your face. Some of us like me who lack the alcohol dehydrogenase enzyme flush bright red with the merest drip of a glass of alcohol. And so this would be a combination that's particularly bad in taking away blood from the heart into the gut and the skin. And that sets you up perfectly. It gives you the perfect uh, storm of uh, situations. For example, also if you're standing on a dinner reception, say a champagne reception, uh, that, that is when you're most likely to have your lowest blood pressure and feel unwell and, and feel like passing out. You could also imagine, uh, maybe even if you don't pass out, uh, back in the days when you were, when we were all at university uh, or school, where the most difficult lesson to stay awake for was always the post lunchtime lesson, that two o'clock lesson, and that there's also a reason for that. You are dilating this vessel and taking away some of this useful blood supply to the brain that is now being diverted down into this lower limb. So that, that's the explanation, Trudy, for the pulse prandial symptom. Uh, I, I, I guess uh, the, the other question that may be related to this is why we have symptoms of lightheadedness, particularly when we uh, get up in the morning. And uh, when we wake up in the morning, uh, for, uh, after a whole night's sleep, what we're doing is we are getting up from a supine position, number one. Number two, we have been evaporating all night under the duvet. So typically we sweat and these are called insensible losses. So we're pretty dehydrated first thing in the morning. Uh, in addition to that, we've been producing urine all night, typically three to 500 mils. And that's why you feel compelled typically to bounce out of bed and get into the loo to empty your bladder. That is a fairly quick uh, uh, change in posture for most of us. And finally, we haven't been drinking anything all night. It's typical for us to, for those of us who sleep at night without waking up, that we sleep for the whole six to eight hours without taking any fluids. And this is the only time in the 24 hour period that we're not taking fluid. So the worst that you will ever feel if you have a propensity for pre-syncope or syncope is typically first thing in the morning for those reasons.